legitimately afraid right now. I've been avoiding talking about this conspiracy theory for like three or four years and you know why? Because people who look into this tend to wind up dead in really strange circumstances. You guys have been so patient putting up with my art videos and my book reviews so I feel like I owe this to you. Let's just do it for the views. Here we go. Today we're going to be talking about the Franklin cover-up. And I'm not going to be shocked if you looked at the title of this video and you have no idea what I'm talking about because it's kind of hard to find information about this. And that's by design, apparently. This scandal involves a Republican lobbyist, a small people's credit union, a home for foster children, and satanic ritual abuse? There are very few public records on this case, and what I mean by that is most of the records are actually sealed and impounded by the FBI, which is exactly as serious as it sounds. If I disappear, just somebody please investigate, please. There is no Wikipedia page for the Franklin cover-up, the Franklin scandal, the Franklin Community Federal Credit Union, Lawrence King or any of his victims. No American Media Association would touch this story. But there is one, one documentary that was produced by actually a British production company. It was commissioned by the Discovery Channel in 1996 and they were given half a million dollars to be able to produce the documentary. But right before it was to air, the Discovery Channel received a threat from an undisclosed congressman's office and the rights to the documentary were purchased and ordered to be destroyed. But there survives one rough cut film which contains some of the interviews and evidence gathered by this production team and it's now available here on this delightful and terrifying internet. I want to make it clear that what we're going to speak about today is literally just scratching the surface of this topic. This story is like the definition of the phrase down the rabbit hole, I'm serious. Our story begins around 1980 in Omaha, Nebraska. As I mentioned before, there's not a ton of public record on this, so it's hard for me to nail down exactly when things started and ended. But the story begins at a failing credit union. The Franklin Community Federal Credit Union hired Lawrence E. King to try to kind of save it. When banks fail, it can usually lead to like economic collapse within the town or city, and that's really, really bad. So the bank hired Lawrence King to sort of revive it and bring in higher caliber clientele so more money could be coming into the bank. So Lawrence King was hired as the general manager of this bank, and he was a really charismatic guy who was able to go out to the nicer parts of town where the rich people were and convince them to put their money into his bank. Lawrence King became very successful and he became sort of this symbol of power within the black community in Nebraska. And Lawrence's connection to richer families in Omaha and throughout Nebraska seemed to save this credit union, or so it seemed. The story also begins with a rather large nonprofit organization called Boys Town. Boys Town, which was originally called Flanagan's Home for Boys, was originally founded in 1917 as a home for orphans that were left after the First World War. Since then, it's grown a whole lot and it's called the City of Little Men. It covers over 1,300 acres of buildings where kids can live and go to school. And the idea is for it to be like a religious, but at the same time, like very nurturing, safe environment for children. And at the time of these events, Boys Town was run by a priest named Father Val Peters. So as Lawrence King began expanding the Federal Credit Union, he sort of started reaching out to Boys Town. He sought to involve the kids that were staying in Boys Town in the happenings of the credit union and also some of his other business ventures. And yes, my friends, that's what we call a red flag. 
It was kind of like, like we call it internships today, right? Like parents were probably thinking, oh, what a great opportunity for my kid to go work with this really successful man and learn about banking, you know? So according to the employees of the credit union, about once a month, one or two kids from Boys Town would be incorporated into the inner workings of the bank. King could also be seen going to pick up kids after school so that they could go work for him. There's another red flag, huh? And no one thought much of this, which is really weird, except for the AFC, which was over the foster care system in Omaha, Nebraska. And they started receiving odd reports. These reports at first seemed like there was absolutely no way that they could be true. These were stories told by kids that were staying at Boys Town of attending Lawrence's late night parties in his beautiful mansion. And these parties were decorated with other high ranking officials in the town, including the chief of police. Tales of abuse, exploitation, and strange trips across the country paid for by King to cities such as Washington, D.C. And lastly, and most strangely, satanic rituals. I'm not gonna go into specifics about what these kids went through because I just don't find that that is entertaining. It's highly disturbing and I find it kind of disrespectful. So if you really feel like you need that information, there are other sources here on YouTube that you can go check out for that, but we're not gonna do that here. But when I say abuse and exploitation, I think we all know what I'm talking about here. And I know that if you look into this, a lot of people like kind of go into the satanic panic and oh, these are satanic rituals. Honestly, to me, they're not satanic. They're like worse than satanic. So the director of foster care, her name was Carol Stitt. Over the course of a couple years, I think, she started collecting evidence and stories from kids in the foster system and their parents. And she claims that she had a stack of evidence that was over one foot high of testimony of these rituals and abuse and exploitation of minors. And she submitted it to the police. And to this day, to this day, the Omaha police deny ever receiving that evidence from the AFC. How? How? So what about the officials at Boys Town? What do the people running that organization have to say about it? Well, Father Peter did actually receive some stories from his kids about being abused, received some complaints, and he decided to open his own investigation without going to the police. So we're gonna side note right here, and this is something that I can't believe I actually have to say, but if you're in a situation and there are kids being harmed do not go to the principal, do not go to your coach, do not go to your preacher, do not go to your youth group leader, do not go to your camp counselor. Go directly to the police or go to CPS. The only way that anybody is ever going to get justice is if you go through either one of those authorities. In this case, we will learn that the police in Omaha were super, super corrupt, but we'll get into that. So, needless to say, Father Peter had his little investigation and absolutely nothing came of it and probably countless kids were continually abused after that because of him. So Lawrence King has all of these stories and rumors following him around about how he abuses children and basically sells them to the elite and he got in trouble but for something that seems to be completely unrelated. The IRS started noticing that lots and lots of money was kind of just disappearing from the Franklin Credit Union. And meanwhile, Lawrence King was living the life of like an actual king. He had four gorgeous homes, three of which were in Omaha, one of which was in Washington, D.C. He had limos, he had boats, he had fancy jewelry, he had everything you could ever want. And it turns out he was pocketing almost every single cent he recruited into his own bank. In April 1988, the bank was raided by the IRS and the FBI and Lawrence King was arrested. And they discovered that he stole over $40 million, which today is an incomprehensible sum of money. But if you think about 1988, holy crap. So you're thinking, great, everybody's looking into this dude's paper trail and they're gonna figure out that he's like the kingpin of this child sex trafficking ring. You're 100% wrong. <laughs> the FBI completely dove into this guy's financial history and everything regarding the kids at Boys Town, his like connections to the elite, his weird trips and parties to Washington DC was completely just swept under the rug, magically. Now, most of King's victims were housed at Boys Town or were kind of like in the foster system or came from really dysfunctional homes, but some did not. 
A teenage girl named Alicia Owen, who came from a very stable, loving home, came forward and told her story. She said that she was abused under Lawrence King and other high-ranking officials in Omaha and across the country, and even the chief of police in Omaha. Now this is where things get a bit topsy-turvy. We're about to get a little weird here. Everyone in Omaha and across the world had known that Lawrence stole $40 million, right? And he was facing felony charges for that. He was supposed to do jail time. But for some reason, no matter how loudly the victims and their parents cried, no one took the sex allegation seriously at all. Every single testimony by a parent or by a child was discredited and swept away just like it didn't exist. So if you Google the Franklin cover-up, all you're going to get on the first page is four articles from 1988 to 1990, and they were all written by, like, the same guy. Most of these articles are just extremely biased, and they deny that there was any credible evidence ever, which is just insane to me because the reports came from the AFC. How is that not credible? It's odd because in one of the titles, they literally describe these kids' abuse as melodrama. They basically just brushed it off as if it was completely impossible. Oh, these kids are just so melodramatic, and yet here we are. It's 2020, and Epstein didn't kill himself. So thankfully, somebody was actually listening. The senator of Nebraska at the time, his name was Lauren Schmidt, he decided to open his own investigation. He hired two PIs that were former police officers to look into this, and he told them, don't bring me rumors, don't bring me hunches, I need hard evidence, that's all I want from you guys. He listened when he was told of numbers of children being sold and trafficked. He listened when they explained to him the grooming process for these kids and the illegal substances they were forced to take. Some of the victims claimed that they were given heroin and cocaine so that King could make sure that they would keep coming back to him. Schmidt listened when the kids told them of the illegal acts that they were forced to commit to provide collateral so King could make sure that they wouldn't talk. And as soon as he opened this investigation, Senator Schmidt received threatening phone calls. He was straight up told that if he dug too deep, it was going to lead him to the highest levels of the Republican Party, and to not to do that because he was a good Republican, right? Carol Stitt, who again was the director of foster care, started receiving threatening phone calls. The day before that she was set to testify in court, she received a phone call that said, if you talk, you will not live to regret it. Meanwhile, the two investigators that Schmidt hired were finding more and more evidence. They were finding all these victims that were unconnected to one another, but all had scary similarities in their stories. And the kids were as young as seven years old, and they were describing things that there's, there's just no way that kids should know that. There were a ton of dots being connected for these two investigators, and unfortunately, they paid the price for it. So it seemed to be the story was that Lawrence King was a party guy and a procurer of young kids for elite clients. And he wasn't just partying with people from Omaha. He had a huge network of clients across the entire United States. So what it looked like was a vicious crime ring that was just hiding in the shadows of this country. So Alicia Owens was the one victim that like really was determined to push forward and get justice for herself. And a couple other victims who ended up being key witnesses came forward to help her as well. One of which was Troy Bonner. Troy stated that he had actually been with Alicia during some of her abuse. However, the more Troy talked, the more he began kind of receiving pressure from the FBI. He was interviewed several times by agents and he was According to him, he was basically told, like, no, if you testify in court, if you tell your story in the court of law under oath, we will find you guilty of perjury. It's not like, well, if you're lying, you might be found guilty of perjury. No, they, they told him straight up, like, we will find you guilty of perjury and we will put you away for 20 years, period. So Troy Bonner actually agreed to recant his original statement and basically call Alicia and everybody else liars because he was afraid of the FBI. And then the FBI pressured him to like help them and try to like expose Alicia Owens as this liar. So he let them like tap his phone and stuff and nothing ever really came of that other than they tapped his phone. Paul Benassi is another guy that came forward who was a victim and also oddly a perpetrator. He has one of the most interesting stories in this entire case and I'd love to do like a full video on him but I think he really just wants to like have a life for the first time ever. I can't imagine what any of these people have gone through but Paul Benassi specifically, it's just like, wow. So at the time of these events, Paul was around 21 years old. 
and he had been recruited into this crime ring at the age of, I think it fluctuates between three-year-old and six-year-old. So Benassi claimed to be a victim of not only this crime ring, but he was also a subject in Project Monarch. I'm not allowed to actually link to my video on Project Monarch, but if you go to my channel and you look up Max Spears, you can see I have a two-part series on Project Monarch-esque stuff. It was a weird government program. It was a real thing that actually happened, and it's super scary. So in the 80s, Paul was actually diagnosed with multiple personality disorder. I've heard conflicting reports on this that he actually was misdiagnosed with DID and he doesn't actually have multiple personalities, but I'm not 100% on that at this point. DID is thought to be a psychological disorder that is born out of childhood trauma, basically. So in order to cope with your trauma, you basically develop these alters or multiple personalities. So Paul was not only a victim of Lawrence's crime ring, but he was also a participant. He ended up being a procurer of children. And Paul was involved with recruiting recruiting, uh, there were varying um, techniques, one of which was peer pressure. He would befriend young boys and girls and basically kind of lure them away and stuff like that. And it went all the way to just like straight up assisted kidnapping. Paul, at the age of 21 in 1986, confessed to his lawyer, John DeCamp, that he assisted in the abduction of Johnny Gosh. I'm sure you guys have heard of this case. Johnny Gosh was the original milk carton boy. He was abducted in 1982. He was abducted on the street corner of his neighborhood while he was doing his paper route in Des Moines, Iowa. And you may have seen the Netflix documentary, Who Took Johnny? I don't think Netflix produced it, but it's been on there for a while. Johnny is believed to be kidnapped by a sex trafficking ring and he is also believed to still potentially be alive. His mother Noreen not only believes that he's alive today but she does actually believe Paul Benassi's story regarding the abduction of her child because Paul was able to give intimate details about Johnny that literally only she knew so she totally believes Paul. Paul was actually brave enough to take the stand next to Alicia Owens and tell his story in order to bring his abusers to justice. So back to the investigators, one of which, Gary Caridori, was receiving a lot of threats and intimidation because of the work that he was doing in investigating this crime ring. Someone broke into his family home, he was followed, his vehicles were tampered with, his phone was tapped. So in 1990, Gary Caridori took a trip to Chicago so he could follow new leads regarding this investigation, but he decided to take his eight-year-old son AJ with him so that they could go see a baseball game. It was an all-stars game and AJ was really excited about it. But as Gary was flying home with his son in his private plane on July 11th, 1990, a farmer saw the plane flying over his fields and then he saw a flash and then the plane exploded. And both Gary and his son AJ were killed in the crash. The wreckage of the crash was strewn over a mile wide and neither Gary's luggage or his briefcase were ever recovered from the wreckage. Within 24 hours, all physical evidence of the crash was impounded by the FBI and remains so to this day. And all information regarding the crash has been impounded by court order. And this is where I start feeling a little nauseous. So this incident obviously shook absolutely everybody. The witnesses, Lauren Schmidt, Carol Stitt, <laughs> everybody, everybody involved was completely shaken by this because there was just, it's too coincidental. It's way too coincidental. And Gary's whole family believes that he was knocked off by somebody. So this whole incident did inspire Troy Bonner to come forward for the sake of Gary's family and recant his recantation and tell the truth about what happened to him and what happened to Alicia and Paul Benassi. But during Caridori's funeral, Troy and his mom were there and they saw FBI agents that they had spoken to before kind of looming on the outskirts of the crowd, sort of watching everybody. So this scared Troy, but then his brother Sean was found dead 
from a gunshot wound. And according to his family, Sean just wasn't that kind of guy. He wasn't reckless. He was super responsible. He was in the military and he was discovered with a gunshot wound and they ruled his death an accident playing Russian roulette. So this obviously scared Troy and his mother and they ended up going into hiding and they did not participate in the trial whatsoever. So Alicia had been arrested and she was basically awaiting trial and her brother was incidentally arrested for joyriding in a stolen vehicle and the day before I think it was she was set to go on the stand he was found hung in his jail cell. I mean, it was ruled a suicide, but there was clear evidence that he had been beaten up before he hung himself. So poor Alicia, her brother winds up murdered, basically, and they're telling her it's a suicide, and she takes the stand and she tells her story about how she was abused for most of her life, and then she was found guilty of perjury, and she was sentenced to 9 to 25 years in prison. Which to me is just, I'm sorry, that's like unprecedented for like a rape victim or abuse victim to like come for Forward and tell their story, which is just so hard, and then to be told that you're a liar and then being given the maximum sentence. And it's not because of what she was saying. It was because of who she was accusing. She was accusing the chief of police. She was accusing like all these high ranking officials in Omaha. I think they wanted to send a message like, look, if you, if we abused you and you feel like coming forward and throwing us under the bus, look what happens. You'll get 25 years. Three months after this, Lawrence King finally goes to trial. He's found guilty and he was sentenced to, wait for it, 15 years in prison. 10 less than his victim. Yep. This was clearly done to send a message and I just can't get over it. According to John DeCamp, this was just them saying like, look, look, even though, even after all we've done to you, like if you even think about coming forward, look what we can do. Look what we can do to you. So John DeCamp was the lawyer of Alicia Owens and he ended up being the lawyer for Paul Benassi. And he is just kind of the unsung hero of this entire thing. He basically gave his life to be able to defend these victims. Not only just Alicia and Paul, he defended tons of, of the victims and sought justice for all of them and really advocated for all of these kids. He thankfully got Alicia out after four and a half years and basically demanded a retrial because what happened in the first trial, it turned out the jury was basically given video evidence of people's testimonies but then they found out that the videos that the jury was given were edited. So a ton of evidence was just like cut out and the jury never even saw it. So Alicia Owens gets a retrial and Paul Benassi helps her out. He testifies again. And again, they ask Troy Bonner like, hey, will you testify? Like you could really help us out. And uh, Troy agreed. And then he was basically handed a subpoena by the opposition and threatened by the FBI once again and went into hiding immediately in Chicago. If I just, ah, it's so frustrating because if anyone, if anyone who was an official had taken any of the victims seriously, it would have set off this chain reaction that just would have blown the lid off of so much corruption going on in the United States. It just baffles my mind. It wouldn't have just gotten King in trouble for what he had done. It would have like gotten to people so much higher up the totem pole than him. Like they're knocking people out of the sky. They took an airplane down. They're clearly not just covering up this like group of old gross creepers that are living in Omaha. This, this has to be bigger than that. So anyway, back to the lawyer. John DeCamp was an absolute hero. He stuck by Paul Benassi the entire way through. Everybody tried to discredit him because of his multiple personality disorders. He wrote a book about all of this and it's still in publication today. You can buy it. It's called The Franklin Cover-Up. Alicia Owens was actually set free. She won her second trial and she, to my knowledge, is still alive today and she's just living her life. She doesn't do any interviews, nothing like that. I don't even think she has a Facebook and Paul Benassi is out of jail and he won a settlement with the state of Nebraska. He was awarded a million dollars for all the things that he went through. And he, I think, is married now and has two children. And that's the other thing, right? It's like, if these kids were trying to like sensationalize this weird just conspiracy they cooked up in their heads, they would be doing more like interviews. They would be writing books. They would be trying to milk it for everything that it's worth. And none of these people want any attention. They just kind of want to disappear and just be normal. And so that's why I don't understand why the media was just trying to say that all oh, these kids just cooked it up. It's just satanic panic. This is just, I mean, how do these kids that aren't even close in age 
that aren't related to each other at all have such similar stories. In all of these cases, this thing, this this cover-up, this scandal has ruined these people's lives. I just, I don't get how people can just call them liars. Unfortunately, I feel I need to tell you this, Troy's story did not end well at all. Troy was an addict and he apparently was first given drugs by Lawrence King's group and that was one of the methods they used to recruit and to keep kids around was to give them controlled substances and keep giving them to them so that they keep coming back and he struggled with that for many years and in 2003 right before the election Troy Bonner showed up in a hospital in New Mexico and he was waving around John DeCamp's book the Franklin cover-up and he was screaming they're after me they're after me because of this book and he ended up having to be sedated by nurses and he was put in a room for observation and the next morning they went to check on him and he was sitting in a chair in his room with blood coming out of his mouth or what seemed to be blood and he was very much dead. All requests for an autopsy have been denied and there was never any follow-up in investigation into what happened to him. Larry King is out of prison now. I think he was released in 2001 so he did not finish his sentence and I think he's just out there living life. I'm sure he hasn't changed. I don't really see somebody like that coming to Jesus exactly. Um, he's very old now but I have no doubt that he is still very much the same person he was before he went to jail. There is a whole lot more <laughs> to do with this case. I feel like I haven't even really done it justice, and I might do a full version on my Patreon at some point. Let me know if you guys want it. I'll offer it for a dollar. I know this was really dark, guys, but I know that you were kind of wanting something from this realm from me after everything I've been doing lately. So I just hope you guys enjoyed this. If you'd like to support this channel, because let's be honest, we all know this is getting demonetized, you can head over to my website. And I might have a coupon code in the description. I'm offering custom journals. Go check it out if you want to support this channel and get something out of it. So thanks for being here today, guys. Stay safe. Don't talk to strangers. Until next time, take care.